Welcome to this workshop on native plant gardening in Central Arizona with an emphasis on the low deserts of Maricopa County and surrounding areas. First, the Maricopa Native Seed Library that is putting on this workshop, just to provide some background information about us, we are a service of the Maricopa Community Colleges, and our mission is to equip the community with seeds and knowledge to create habitat at home. We're inspired by the books of Doug Tallamy, especially his, his latest book, uh, Nature's Best Hope, which talks about the need for habitat in home landscapes because of the diminishing wildlands. The seed library follows a distributed model. Uh, please check our website for updates on where you can find seed. Seed is free, um, although like most seed libraries, we do impose a limit on number of seeds in order to make sure we can reach everyone. The seed library is more than seed distribution. Um, in order to really equip and inspire people, we're doing several other things. We're creating demonstration gardens at several of the campuses. Um, and the idea here is that folks can come and view the plants and see what they look like live and then go into the seed library and, and go ahead and make selections for which plants to grow at home. We're also offering workshops that are related to native plant gardening, such as this one, and creating lessons for um, high school students and non-majors biology, among others, to um, inspire uh, the use of native plants and learn about native plant conservation and tie um, the gardens that we're building into curriculum. And uh, more broadly, we're developing uh, other ways to involve students uh, and across the curriculum at Maricopa Community College, including internships, work study positions, and other opportunities. I'm Danielle Carlock, and I've recently founded the Native Seed Library. I've been gardening in Phoenix for about 10 years, and you can see kind of a before and after picture of my yard in 2011, I started out with bare dirt, and I added a couple of trees. There's an um, ironwood here in the corner that's now kind of back here in 2019. It's generally the same orientation, um, hiding a little bit behind this Palo Verde, but you can kind of see that some of the things I've done. I do have about 150 species. I focused a lot on plants to support wildlife. Um, and most of my experience is really drawn from this gardening project. I don't have any formal training in horticulture. I am a science librarian and formerly a high school biology teacher, and I'm active in the Arizona Native Plant Society. This workshop will um, be presented in four segments, and actually I'm, only, I'm recording each segment separately. So this segment that we're going to talk about and here is why should I incorporate native plants in my landscape? The other three segments will be recorded separately, and those will be looking at what are the major plant groups in our area, with an emphasis on those that support our pollinators, and then looking specifically at the pollinator groups that we have here in central Arizona. And then the fourth segment that will be recorded will be about native gardening, getting into specifics about soils and maintenance and design and things like that. So let's talk about what a native plant is. That's an important component of everything really we're doing here. And I have a couple of definitions from different federal agencies. And if you kind of read those over, you can see that uh, one of the main um, defining features of a native plant is that it's been present in an area for a long period of time, which means it's evolved in that area and also co-evolved with the other members of the ecosystem. Um, which includes everything from microorganisms to mammals to birds, uh, insects, and so on and so forth. In the Americas, generally we define uh, native plants as having been present before European colonization and settlement. So any of the plants brought over during that time period would not be considered native plants to the Americas. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, native plants have co-evolved with other members of the ecosystem, and so they have developed and evolved relationships with them, and that's a really important kind of overarching theme um, across really this whole uh, workshop series. Native plants are often defined as being what they call straight species. They have not been subject to artificial selection by humans. In other words, there's been no um, artificial um, propagation 
uh, for specific traits by native plants. So as they exist in the wild naturally. Now this is in contrast to nativars and cultivars. So a cultivar is sort of the opposite of a um, native plant because it has been subjected to artificial selection by humans. Think of how we engage in uh, dog breeding or horse breeding. It's the same sort of idea is that um, plant uh, horticulturists, they look for traits that they want to propagate more wi widely. And so they will um, find a plant or plants that have that trait and then begin to propagate them asexually um, in order to preserve that trait. That's the only way to ensure that the trait will be present in all the offspring is to use asexual reproduction, where um, now we're getting a lot of plants that are essentially clones of each other and we're losing genetic diversity. So cultivars in the landscape um, do not have any genetic diversity, which is uh, troubling because any changes in the environment, there's not diversity there that natural selection can act upon. And so the general recommendation is to be really careful about what type of cultivars you bring into your yard. We'll talk about the four pictures there in a moment of coneflower, um, the straight species, and, and three of the what's called native R's of that. Um, and now a native R is really just a, a type of cultivar. It's a cultivar of some native species. And how you'll be able to tell that it's a native R is that um, when it's offered, it will have its Latin name, uh, the two word genus and species name, the scientific name, followed by something in English that's often in parentheses and maybe something whimsical or something that's describing the trait. So cherry brandy refers to the color that they've changed the, the color of the plant. Um, black, that's black eyed Susan and typically that's yellow. So there's a red version that's a, a native R. <clears throat> and then the, the other one is co purple coneflower magnus, and that's actually what's pictured here is purple coneflower, top left, the, the straight species or uh, native plant, and then you have um, a color variety, a green um, selected, selected for green, and you can see that um, it's altered in, you know, its color. But then in the one on the bottom, that one's actually Magnus, bottom right. And that is um, one that's been selected for thick, fuller petals. And then on the bottom left is actually a double flower, a double, a double, a double flower, I guess is the best way they call it, native R. And this one is um, typically harmful because either there's not much pollen and nectar produced or it's inaccessible to pollinators. So when you're thinking about nativars and cultivars, think carefully about what you might bring into your yard. Um, if the trait is more benign or not and whether it's beneficial or harmful or neutral to pollinators. So the green purple, uh, excuse me, the br what used to be a purple coneflower, the green coneflower now at the top right is one that the, the color's been changed. And it's not going to be as attractive to a lot of pollinators. So that could be harmful. The bottom right is one that has um, increased petals, probably going to be more neutral. And then the double flowered, I would really recommend to outright avoid. So really um, be intentional if you're going to choose any cultivars to try to keep them to a minimum. Don't load your garden with them. And um, be mindful about the trait and how it may affect pollinators. Things that might be cool for us, like a new flower color, is cool for humans, but it's not beneficial to pollinators. So thinking about how we can still support pollinators, the best way to do so is always going to be to use native plants, the straight species, the unaltered. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't include some of these in your yard, but be very careful in your selection of them. So now we're going to look at five different um, reasons to kind of incorporate native plants into the landscape. And this is uh, things that you might use to um, if you have friends or family who aren't sure, or if maybe you still have some doubts about the value of native plants, these are some points to, to ponder. Now, ecological, we've, ha we've um, hit on this a bit already. And the idea here is that there's a lot of support, a lot of research support that native plants are more beneficial to wildlife than non-natives. Um, and this makes sense because of coevolution between 
these plants and the wildlife that use them. So I would go so far to say that Arizona's wildlife does depend on native plants for their survival. It's what they've co-evolved with, and there's so many different interactions between plants and insects and um, birds and mammals and other wildlife that there's really an interdependency there. Also, native plants provide what's called free ecosystem services, services to us. Food, shade, water purification, and flood regulation are just several of these services. And really, um, economists have tried to value these type of services, and they're, they're almost um, impossible to put a value on, or put a price tag on. Lots of different services that are provided to us. Also, we've had a lot of development in our area, and every time there's development, there's a loss of wild spaces. And so by adding natives to the home landscape, you can help restore at least a replica. It's not going to be a perfect um, restoration of what was there, but it can be an approximation of what was there, and it can certainly support wildlife more than what I see is a lot of these inert landscapes in our, our neighborhoods, where I see... Um, Folks, you know, have maybe a couple of species in their yard, maybe quite a bit of them are non-native, then the natives they do have aren't necessarily um, particularly um, high value to wildlife. So that's another ecological reason. And then um, another thought along these lines is that we're continuing to lose wildlands all the time. Fire especially has been very, um, had a lot of severe losses from fire. So that is a definitely another consideration. Um, and actually, many would go further to say that it, it's not just about a buffer, but it's actually um, essential to have habitat at home because our wildlands just are not large enough anymore. There are several economic considerations. There's a lot of ways that the homeowner will save money by having native plants compared to other landscapes. This includes not having to buy fertilizers and pesticides, not spending as much time on yard maintenance or on water bills. And think about how our tourism in our state is really driven a lot by our natural beauty. So by helping to con conserve that, that's really going to help um, conserve our tourism industry. And looking at the pictures here, the top picture is Stinknet, which is um, a very concerning, uh, aggressive, invasive plant and it's forming a mono stand in that first picture. And then below is just some natural Sonoran desert habitat with saguaro fruiting. So you can just imagine, you know, which type of, of view, you know, our tourists going to want to come here for to see. So that's another thought. We also have health considerations. Native plants are uh, by nature, since they don't require pesticides and fertilizers, if you incorporate them, there's less toxins you're adding into the environment. And we know that a lot of these um, chemicals are carcinogens or are harmful in other ways to human health and to health of other species. Also, there's a lot of health benefits that come from having a living landscape at home. Being able to step out, whether it's just a patio or it's a, a large yard with lots of plants, having some sort of living landscape at home that you can step out to, there's so many benefits of nature, and these include things like lowering blood pressure, reducing stress, improving mood, and boosting the immune system as just a few. And many plants have that are native have medicinal value, some of which haven't been fully explored. Uh, by continuing to conserve them, we are going to be preserving the possibility of future medicines, and this is two pictures of native plants here that have medicinal value. And many of our, our native plants have medicinal values. There are moral and spiritual considerations as well. Um, we could argue that all living things have intrinsic value, and so they should be conserved. So by conserving at home, you're contributing to that. Also, you'd be hard-pressed to find a spiritual tradition anywhere in human history, um, in time or, or space, where there wasn't teachings about valuing nature and the interconnectedness of all living beings. So if you are a spiritual person, there's definitely an argument there to have habitat at home. And then once you have that habitat at home, it's a place for various spiritual practices. 
And finally, aesthetics and a sense of place. Native plants are beautiful. They provide year-round color and interest and attract wildlife that can be enjoyed. <clears throat> Native plants also provide a sense of place. There's been a lot of um, lamenting about um, a lot of our urban and suburban areas throughout our country look the same. They have very similar plantings. They have the same big box stores. They have um, a lot of the same types of you know, houses, these cookie cutter houses. So we're losing a sense of place. Um, but native plants can help preserve that. And so that's another important consideration. And that's the end of this segment about reasons to consider native plants, their value, and so on and so forth. I hope you'll look forward to our other upcoming segments, which will include looking at plant groups of central Arizona, pollinators of central Arizona, and gardening techniques in central Arizona.